Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Dauphin, Manitoba Mayor David Boziak. But before we get into today's interview, I just want to make him take a quick moment and ask you to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and all of our latest municipal shows. From the Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, to this show, the Cross Border Interviews, you do not want to miss an episode because we have great conversations, great insights, and great commentary about everything municipal. Now, on to the show. David, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Uh, I want to start with a generic question, and I start off all my interviews with it, so you're no exception. But where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, David? Um, It's interesting. I'll go back quite a long way. Um, In most things that I was involved in, whether I was an athlete on a sport team or whatever, there seemed to be this, as as I reflected on it after you um, asked, uh, you know, gave me those sort of front end general questions, I always, I I look back and went, hmm, I never really wanted to be the captain or the leader, but it seemed that depending upon a number of circumstances, I would gravitate to that kind of position. So whether it was on a sports team or in university or high school, I was on student councils and, and, and then in organizations that I involved in professionally over the years, it seemed that over a period of time, I would gravitate more to a leadership position. And I don't know if that comes from just um, having a bit of a critical thinking and an analytical point of view of how things could be. And or I live by a cliche of somebody has to do something. And so I hold that true and dear to myself saying, well, if I'm going to live by a, a credo like that, then I should be one who's always willing to stand up and do something first and not expect um, someone else to do something based on, you know, what I observe and then criticize, oh, they should do this. And, you know, I'm famous for for being in groups and meetings and, and uh, you know, stopping someone in their tracks as as they're talking around the table about they or we should when, you know, I would respond and say, well, does that mean you? And does it mean you own it completely, but will you lead it or will you guide it or will you help it? Because there's nothing that rankles me more than, you know, people having comments and or um, positions on certain things, but aren't willing to step up. So maybe that's all part of it, sort of a, a long answer to, I always felt that someone could do something and why not me? So what was the allure of municipal politics? Because you 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 could have chosen many different routes. And I've done a little research on you because I try to learn a little bit about you. But you could it seems like you could have chosen many different levels of government. You, you could have gone provincially, you could have gone federally, but you ultimately, at the end of the day, made a decision to go municipally. And really what the show is about is why people get involved municipally. You talk about being that leader, talking about doing something. What was it about municipally that you wanted to do something about? Well, to respond initially, municipal politics is, and and, you know, you hear it all the time from politicians, we're the closest to the people. We're the ones with the the buck stops with us. And so there's always a greater likelihood that if you want to do something or want to get engaged, you are closer to the action, closer to the people who might be able to do it. So that's part of the answer. The other part is, um, years ago, uh, I'll tell you a story. Years ago, when I was in university, um, I initially wanted to be a physical education teacher. And then um, while I was uh, finishing up my physical education degree, uh, the rec degree program came on stream at the university. And I meandered into that program and, and really felt that being involved in building community through recreation was something that seemed really consistent with a lot of my views. So 
while I was in class, a, a good men, a mentor of mine who I actually worked with afterwards and have, you know, had a professional and a personal relationship for since I was in university, um, basically used the example back in the day in the early 1980s that the dolphin was a great bad example of how the recreation delivery system was organized. And not that we didn't have a recreation delivery system, a baseball, softball, an arena, those kinds of things. It was traditional for a small prairie town in the 80s. But he suggested that the organization of it was inefficient. We didn't have a rec commission or a rec department. We had a number of different volunteer and or public groups, agencies trying to do it, but the wheels would fall off quite easily because there was no overarching sort of organization. And so I kind of had that as a chip on my shoulder from the early days in the 80s, thinking maybe there's an opportunity that I could go back there and maybe try and help make it better. So by luck, by chance, by golly, I got an opportunity to move back to Dauphin right after I graduated from university. One job led to another. And so I was always involved in recreation delivery, but by extension, municipal governance. And so I found that it was very important. And to this day, I'm, I'm doing a workshop in a couple of weeks with rec practitioners about recreation um, governance and, and how you get your message across to decision makers. And, and what, I, what I sort of gravitated towards was that municipally, you can get things done. If you get your ducks in a row, you get people pulling on the same end of the rope and you can have some small successes. So I, I sort of used that philosophy when I started to work in recreation in the you know, early 90s here in Dauphin. We got a lot of good stuff done. And then one thing led to another. I've been on the Economic Development Board for probably 20 years. I was involved in a number of different community groups and organizations. And I also believe in a bit of a philosophy of you can always lead from the side or lead from the back by influencing people. So you don't have to be the mayor or the counselor or the chair of the committee, but by developing relationships, using connections, um, not burning a bridge as you meet someone or work with someone on a particular project, that when you bring all of that together, things can happen. So municipal governance was always on my radar. And then um, over the years, I was quite vocal, honestly, in challenging other councils um, when they wouldn't do things that I thought were the right things to do. You know, why won't you make that investment in whether it's recreation or whatever, or why won't you do this? And so I was always involved. And then when the opportunity came up of, okay, who's next? We had a couple of, um, you know, we had a, a very um, energetic um Mayor and Eric Irwin, who was just, you know, 100 miles an hour, pedal to the metal, just, you know, I, I used to joke, he'd say things like he had a dolphin tattoo, like he just believed in our community and, and, you know, he pushed a lot of buttons and, you know, was hard on a lot of people at different levels to get good things for our community, but it was all with the right intention. It was all about community, not about him. It was about making us a better place. And and so I got I knew Eric. I played hockey with him. He was on the rec commission. Was I was when I was the general manager. He came to the gym uh, that I owned, and we used to spend many minutes, hours, um, you know, on treadmills beside each other talking about issues. And so. Um, I got a sense of what it could be like by watching a fellow like him. And then when he untimely passed away, I kind of had this, you know, sense of, okay, now what? And then we had, you know, Mayor Al Dohan step in and Al was quite different than Eric in approach. But again, another fellow who really cared about the community in a different kind of way where Eric pushed really hard. Al wanted to make everyone get along. And just let's keep the train on the tracks. Like, let's not go in the ditch. Let's keep moving forward. And so then when he had his untimely illness and passed away, that notion came back to me of now what? 
Um, and so um, that was a little bit, um, again, sorry, uh, all over the map here with my responses to you. But um, I love it, I though. I love that... it because you're very you're yeah. giving me so many great follow up questions. But I want to I want to ask one in particular. And and I, okay. and I, I was going to ask this later on, but I want to ask it now because we're on this train of you being kind of a recreational fanatic. And I say fanatic in the nicest way possible. Okay. Um as someone who's worked in municipalities, I know that recreation is one of those issues that doesn't really get talked about a lot. And I say that because it's not traditionally where the money is made. It seems right. to go where people, where the municipalities might lose. Pools are a prime example where you lose a lot of money, even uh, sports fields. Why was recreation at the municipal level so important for you and is so important for you? Is it about just making sure that people have something to do in your community so that way they stay there? Or is there an overarching theme about why recreation at the municipal level is so important? That's a million dollar question. And I've, I've honestly spent my whole professional career trying to address that. Um, there was a movement back in the 80s, it was called the Benefits of Recreation, and where, where the big thinkers in the recreation field across the country, this mentor of mine, my professor Jack Harper from the University of Manitoba, um, was leading um, a lot of benefits research. And, and what we were trying to accomplish was getting people to appreciate, because it's very easy um, to measure, the metrics in municipal governance are easy. How much does a a mile of road cost? What's a yard of gravel? What does a grader cost? It's very easy to put, contextualize that on a, on a, you know, pro con or benefit analysis type of thing. Recreation is gooey. Recreation means different things to different people. So if you're a sport person, it's maybe team sports or individual sports. If you're an outdoor person, it's hiking. If you're, um, if you're an indoor person, it might be just reading or relaxing. or So it recreation means so many different things to different people. But the one constant is people. Like everyone has a definition of what they do and what they get out of recreation. Our challenge in the field was to contextualize that and sort of put it into categories. And so I, I just took it upon myself to try and communicate the benefits of recreation. And I'll use an example that I used years ago when we were trying to get our rec complex built in Dauphin, where um, I was doing a presentation in the community, and it was to a group that I would say was not necessarily supporters of the idea of building an indoor pool and a recreation complex. And at this meeting, I, honestly, I was getting grilled pretty good. And I, and I had this sense that maybe I'm not going to win over any minds here today. And maybe I just got to get out of here with my dignity and, and, you know, and, and, and hopefully not lose any momentum as we we're working on this project. And there were some questions and I was getting, actually, it was almost like I was a comedian. I was being heckled a little bit by a few guys in the audience. And then an old gentleman at the very back of the room puts his hand up and I figured, do I, or don't I? you know, let him speak. So I, you know, I, I, I gave him the floor and said, you know, for sure, have at it here. Um, Cause I was feeling that he's just going to pile on some more. And he stood up and he leaned on his chair. Cause he was, he was, he was an older gentleman and he needed the support of the chair. And the first thing out of his mouth, he says, you know, I never did learn how to swim and I'm trying to build an indoor pool. So the first words out of his mouth, so I'm going, okay, here <laughs> comes the next blow. Then the next thing he said was, I used to curl, but my knees don't allow me to curl anymore. Because we were also building a curling rink as the first phase of this development. So I'm going, okay. Strike one, strike in. two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now twist it. And then he said the most profound thing I ever heard about recreation and the benefits. He said to me, but you know, I have a daughter who doesn't live in Dauphin. And she has a couple kids, my grandchildren, that I don't see very much. And I'd love to see them more. But if we build this facility, and if that means they'll come home more often or stay a little bit longer when they're here because we have this facility, I'm in favor of it. And he sat down. And I get goosebumps. I have goosebumps right now because 
that was such a meaningful understanding. He got what benefits meant to him. He wasn't going to participate. He wasn't going to go and watch a sport. He wasn't going to do anything in the facility. But he understood having that facility was going to have a benefit to him because his kids and his grandkids might spend more time with him. Like, poof, it was like amazing that he got it. And the room went completely silent. And the hecklers just swallowed their tongues basically and were kind of everybody thought about that deeply and and it was the and i still use that example this 30 years later because he understood it and so in that benefits of recreation messaging you know we're trying to get politicians and decision makers to understand it's not about having a pool so that kids can swim or even go to swimming lessons but it's possibly to allow someone who may not have that opportunity to now maybe be safe in water. <laughs> it, you know, um, we have one of the highest rates of drowning in the country, partly because we have a lot of people who there's water all around us. They don't know how to swim. They don't know what to do in water. And so what we I've tried to do in my career is get decision makers to understand that, yes, there's a cost. I like to prefer that it's not a cost of recreation. It's an investment in recreation. And that how we measure it is not on the metrics of dollars and cents, but the value to the individual and to the community. Another mentor of mine, Brian Johnson from the West Coast, talks about the public good. So there's private good and public good. And I use the example, I was in a business, I had a fitness center for 30 years. I was providing private good. You had to pay to come to my facility to get the benefit. So, but municipal recreation provides a lot of public good whether it's subsidized programming or free access or just the park or the trail or the green space where you can go and throw a Frisbee or throw a ball and your dog comes, you know, gets it. So there's so many ways to validate the value of recreation. But as a profession, as a field, we have to do a better job of communicating that and getting primarily decision makers at the municipal level to appreciate the value. And I found that telling stories like the one I shared with you about, you know, the, the old gentleman in the, at the meeting, um, that's how people get it. That's how they appreciate it. So that's been my mission, <laughs> my whole career. Now that mission is to try to get people to understand why investment is good you know, and I know that some of the decisions that you make are not going to please 100% of the people. You have to make some tough choices. You talk about that story where you were in that that uh, town hall and you were listening to people basically tell you that you were wrong, in so many words. Is it important to show respect when you are the mayor, you are a public-facing person, who represents a community that you're not just listening to your side of the story and listening to the people that agree with you, but also listening to the people who don't. Well, absolutely. And, 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 that, and that's, and that's critical. And, and, and what I've been trying to do since I've been mayor is do a better job of listening because so often we listen to respond, not to understand. And so I'm trying to listen to understand an alternative or the a, a different point of view. So my first step is always to try and understand what people are saying, but then to use what I know about what they've said and the position they've taken and to use fact to basically challenge a you know, a position in certain regards. And then in other cases to actually go, no, yeah, I think you got me on this one. But one of the things that that um, I'm using for I'm sort of support that has sort of um, floated my boat, so to speak, post COVID was, was how people, individuals, families used recreation to cope 
or get through the various lockdowns and the limitations that we were having. And now post pandemic, we're trying to evaluate some of those effects and how the delivery system, how municipalities respond and how we deal with, you know, again, your, your comment about an opposing point of view or an alternative point of view and whether it's based on fact and logic and reality or whether it's based on just a personal belief, which again, um, I, you know, people can hold whatever beliefs they want as long as the belief they hold only impacts them. So it's one thing to say, oh, this is, you know, you should do this. Well, okay, that's your belief. And as long as that doesn't infringe on other people's rights to have a contrary or different belief, have at it. But as soon as your belief infringes on the rights of others to hold their beliefs in a public, you know, in our society, you start to shake your head a little bit and go, okay, we got to deal with this. So there's, there's an issue here somehow. How do we address it? So, so far, um, I haven't had any of those, I'll call them difficult, challenging discussions, but we've had several. But again, I've been so fortunate to have so far in this first year or so, a very supportive council. Um, we're all thinking similarly and also to have a very competent and supportive administration who, you know, we don't need to have, um, you know, code of conduct rules in our chamber because people are just acting like adults. We're having conversations. Don't we're say that agreeing. too loud. Other municipalities well, might be jealous of well, you there, David. Well, you know, I think I think some of them are actually because because of, of what I've seen, you know, through the Association of Manitoba Municipalities and other things about codes of conduct and how people are acting and and how they're having to ban people at their meetings and other things. And it's and it's just like okay, wow, I, I'm I'm just so fortunate that I don't have to deal with that right now. And I hope I never do. And maybe there's a little bit of my approach and and my philosophy that's sort of oozing out there a little bit. And so, okay, we don't have to be confrontational to disagree, but as long as we bring our facts and our you know information to the table, and again, I can disagree with you and we can leave being friends. Like that should be <laughs> how it goes. But, you know, politics, mostly at a, primarily at a federal level, probably at a provincial level, we see it a lot from the States. It's kind of, you know, there's two poles. And it's just like, you know, actually, we got to be governing from the middle. We have to be able to have dialogue. We have to be able to have discourse. We have to be able to disagree, but also to understand that. And again, I'll, I'll point back to um, Mayor Irwin when he was the mayor, where, man, if he disagreed with you and he knew you were trying to, you know, weasel something in that wasn't based on fact or or what was, he would rip you but he also only on that issue post meeting and i'll use a personal experience with him i won't give you the specifics but we've had many discussions and we disagreed on on some things i would take it personally and i would leave our discussion going man eric i'm so mad at you and the next day he'd see me at the gym and we'd be talking about something else and he is that issue that we spoke about the day before where we were diametrically opposed is gone because he didn't attach the issue or the difference of opinion of the issue to the person, which is a wonderful gift that he shared with me, or I'm trying to same thing. You and I may disagree on something, but tomorrow, if we talk about something different, I'm not going to hold a grudge, which I think many of us are holding those kinds of grudges and not willing to work with someone on a viable good project because three years ago you didn't you know agree with me on that bridge that I wanted to build in my neck of the municipality so I'm not going to support your trail over there you know and they sit there with their arms crossed and we have to get past that and and deal with the issue and not attach it to the person um you've oh, brought up a few things that it, it, it does but you've bring up a few things that i want to ask poignantly here for a second sure i, I try sure. to take this show as an educational purpose not only for myself but for my listeners who are listening because 
I believe, and this is my belief, and you talk about beliefs okay. in that last statement, I believe that there is a very a big, uh, in, in this country, there's a misunderstanding about the jurisdictional rules and areas that municipal governments, provincial governments, and federal governments all deal with. Now, you have been in this position for just over a year, Mayor. Now, are you hearing from your local residents more municipal issues or are they talking about more provincial issues with you? So if they stop you at the grocery store, are they talking about health and education, which are traditionally more in the provincial purview and not talking about wastewater management and budgetary issues and what's going on at the rec facility? Is there an apathy or a misunderstanding around the jurisdictional areas that each level of government holds in your community, do you believe? I think probably the, the best way I can describe it is is a misunderstanding. And I think it's not necessarily based on ignorance in the people, but I think it may be based on our 15-second click society where people are into headlines, they're into the, you know, what do I, what do I do to get a click? What do I, you know, that shock and awe kind of approach to issues. And I think that, and again, not all people, but some people who get sort of sucked into that kind of thing will see the headline, scroll across their feed. That's all algorithm based that they're just, they're just getting further and further down the wormhole based on you know, what they've clicked on in the past, but then they take that and and apply it to something else because, oh, yeah, blah, 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 I heard this about that. And, and so for some people, that is an absolute issue, but that gets back to um, our approach as a council and my approach as the, as the mayor to, we need to inform, we need to provide without overwhelming people. I, I like to use the analogy, we, the Coles Notes version, we have to get to the 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 digestible bits of information that people can digest and understand in their need to get to the next click on their phone or to the next headline and and inform them but i'll i'll throw something out that that you know and again i'm not trying to throw any water on the other levels of government but they've not made it explicitly clear either <laughs> on where their jurisdictions start and stop. And I think that, again, my response to much of this is it's complicated. I wish it was simple. I wish there was a simple answer, but it's not. Because when you look at different charts, and I've seen a few on social media and circulating on the internet, and actually, um, I think AMM may have posted something that um, about federal jurisdictions, provincial jurisdictions, and municipal jurisdictions. And honestly, on the edges, there's always a little bit of blurring. And, and that's the challenging part, because one of the things that, as a municipality, we don't have the luxury of running a deficit. We don't have a luxury of downloading this onto the next layer of government. <laughs> we are it. We're at the bottom of the food chain, right? And so that's the frustration because oftentimes it seems like we're screaming into an echo chamber where whether the senior levels of government don't want to acknowledge or maybe, and I'll give them some credit, they also understand it's very complicated. And sometimes keeping a level of kind of confusion or misunderstanding sometimes is the safest way because then you don't have to say no to something or you don't say yes and charge ahead. You kind of be in that gushy kind of, let's have another meeting. Let's bring them into the discussion. Let's do this. Oh man, um, the house isn't sitting anymore. So we can't make that decision or, Oh, now we're in the blackout period. Can't make, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? Like, the world goes on stuff has to happen so so there's a level of frustration but i i think you're right i think people are confused i think they don't fully understand and again because we're closest to the people oftentimes we get that but i've been extremely again fortunate that i have people at city hall that are very capable in informing 
um, residents and ratepayers on issues. Um, my council and and we will talk to anyone and listen to anyone's point of view. But also, um, you know, my approach is I'll challenge you on your opinions or your beliefs. It's basically to me, it's like prove it. Show me that. Show me that you've done the research. Show me that you are actually stating fact or what is really going on and not what you saw in a scrolling headline on your phone or talked to Joe at the coffee shop yesterday and you're all fired up over something that it's not even our jurisdiction. So, yeah. I, I want to turn to the city as a whole now and I want to ask a, a question, but before I do, I want to preface it by saying this is not a, this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is his opinion. We seem to get emails okay. about this question. I don't know why, but we seem to get it. Um, okay. David, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what yep. do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Dauphin today? I think the biggest issue, and it's a bit of an amalgam of several, but I think it's it's the issue of um, addiction, mental health, which stems into homelessness, which then sort of leaches into sort of um, crime or activity on the streets, which I think is, you know, the overarching um theme or connector in all of that is is poverty and lack of opportunity and so it's sort of sorry there isn't one thing but the blending of those has an impact on our community where we've seen Dauphin is a regional center so as much as we can't get people to come here for education and for health care we also get a lot of people requiring help either with their addiction or mental health issues and many communities that don't have the service are either sending or their residents are ending up in Dauphin because of the belief or the understanding that we have the services. Well, we have services, but our intention and our structure is to provide those services for our residents. As we increase population of a transient nature who are just searching for help, but they end up in our community. It, it puts an added burden on our services, on our delivery systems, many of which on our previous question, those aren't, aren't our jurisdiction. So health, addictions, housing, those aren't municipal responsibilities. But because they're happening in our community, by default, they're part of, it's an issue or a concern we have to deal with. And so that would be, based on my opinion, the number one um, concern um, in a sort of a basket of concerns that we're dealing with. Okay, so the million dollar follow up question to that is, you're right, these are more provincial issues. These are more provincial issues. But you and I both know that the provincial government does not happen overnight. Things don't get changed overnight provincially. Things don't get changed overnight federally. Sometimes they could take months, if not years, to change. You're dealing with these issues now. You are on the front lines. You're the government that's closest to the people. So if you're not doing something, the, the people will be looking at you and saying, why aren't you doing something? So the question has to be, what are you and your council doing to make sure that these issues are being sort of addressed in a timely fashion, but addressed in a way that your residents aren't feeling like all the resources of council and the city are going to those issues and everything else is being left behind? Right. And we're doing something. Yeah. And, and it's back to my own cliche of somebody has to do something and it's us. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop the relationships, strengthen the relationships, work on the relationships. So we're working upstream with the provincial and the federal governments to try and strengthen those relationships and 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 have them, the funders, the, the people that control a lot of what can happen at the ground level, to have them fully understand the circumstances we're in. And not to say, you know, you need to do something, but to say, how can we help you do what your responsibility is in this jurisdiction? So we're working upstream with the other two senior levels of government. We will meet with anyone that we possibly can at any time to have those discussions. And not to blame, but to say, 
you know, and, and not even to put it in a way of, oh, we know it's your responsibility, but we'll help. But it's like, you know, what can we do? It's our community. These are our residents. These are our neighbors. They're our friends. What can we do to help you do what you need to do in our community? We also then are working what I would call it downstream with the not-for-profits and the social service agencies to make them play together in the sandbox. And I use that as an analogy where I think that We've had a lot of community groups and organizations coming together and trying to work together to address these issues. Our challenge and my challenge is the mayor, when we looked at their activity, there was a jurisdictional, I'll use that term loosely, but there was a jurisdictional concern in that none of those organizations had the ability to tell another organization <laughs> what they should or shouldn't be doing. So we had, it's like kids on the playground or at recess, but no teacher supervising. And so there was this frenetic activity, sometimes duplication, oftentimes creating gaps, but as not-for-profits, they're chasing funding dollars all the time. And it, it just it just makes me boil inside when I see the amount of time and energy that not-for-profits and community organizations spend on doing grant proposals and justifying grant applications, which takes away energy and capacity to do what they're supposed to do in the community, and then get a grant that funds A, B, and C, but not D. And then there's no way that they can move the money around to get D accomplished. So as the city, we're saying, how can we help? How can we be the teacher on the playground to have all of you work together and understand what your capacities are, what your weaknesses or where your gaps may be, and how can we work together to fill as many of the gaps as possible to give each of you your own ability to identify and to self-identify and to maintain your own um, piece of the playground because there's this fear and, and this is my personal opinion there's a fear in many of these organizations that they lose status if another group gets a grant that they apply for or well, they're doing what we did. We got that grant last year. Now, we didn't get it, and they got it. So, no, I'm not going to work with them on this project. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to be the adult in the room, and we're trying to say, hey, we need to work together. Now, we, we've we held we, what we've called them several agency meetings where we've brought all of these different groups together. And I, I was leading one of the meetings. I was chairing it, and I said, you know what? If you can't, play with us then just don't but that's okay go and do what you think you can do but just don't work against what we're trying to do so one of the things that i saw oftentimes was behind the scenes an organization would try and cut the knees off of another one because again they got to hire somebody that we wanted or they got money that we were looking for or blah, blah, blah. And so I'm just, you know, we, I just said it straight out at that meeting a couple months ago. If you don't want to be involved, then please don't be in our way. Don't do anything that will hurt what we're trying to do collectively. We won't think any less of you. And if you want to work in that realm and continue to do what you do, have at it, go, like do it very well, but just please don't get in the way or be a barrier of what we're trying to accomplish. So it's easy to say that we're, I'll be honest, we're struggling to achieve that kind of reality because in a small community, you probably would, you know, nod that people hold grudges and, no. and not, yeah, <laughs> you know, not on purpose, but just, you know, it's really hard when you have a lot of history with a person in that organization or that organization, or, you know, I still hear stories, you know, off the record about, yeah, seven years ago, so-and-so did something and, and it, you know, really hurt our ability to do that. I said, seven years ago, like, are you kidding me? That's still bothering you today. And yeah, it does bother people. And so that's, that's one of our biggest challenges into working with, the downstream groups to say, 
let's be adults. Let's try and work together. Let's put past grievances or grudges behind us and work together on what we can do to do something. Now, uh, I, I, I want to flip a little bit here for a second yeah. because I want to talk about that downstream movement here. And I'm going to bring up a subject that's kind of sensitive, but I still need to talk about it a little bit. Um, when something of an in, a major incident, like uh, uh, the bus crash that happened earlier this year that uh, unfortunately took the lives of seniors in your community, that's when you see community rally together. That's when you see those nonprofit organizations put aside those differences, right? And actually come yes. together and work for the community. So while there might be grudges in times of need, they do come together, correct? Yes. Uh, you know, the cliche is a disaster brings people together. So as, as bad as a disaster is for the community, fire, flood, accident, it does bring people together. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you for answering that. I just wanted to make sure I put that on the record. But on the flip side, you talk about the levels of government who need to come together to address this issue. We're forgetting the big picture, the biggest part that needs to come as well. And that's the people. People need to buy into the idea that we need to address these issues. Do you see people actually wanting to step up and say, OK, uh, David, we need to address these issues. We need to come together as a community and not work individually, but work as a team and do it for Team Dauphin instead of just doing it for Team X or Team Y or Team B over here, but do it as a whole. Do people get engaged when it comes to the issues that are facing your community? Um, I think for the most part, yes. And the reason I say that is, and again, with me now being the mayor and our council and the approach we're taking is you can criticize, you can complain, you can bring a grievance to our attention, but you also have to come with a solution or some solutions. If you want to just throw stones, we'll listen, but our response won't be the same as if if you come to us with a grievance or an issue or a concern, but then also have at least gone through the process of thinking about what might be a possibility. Now, in some regards, they've nailed it. And then they just brought it to our attention. And we go, hey, great. I'm glad you brought the concern to our attention. And the solution, yes, will address it. In other cases, we can then counter and say, okay, this is a very complex situation and you brought us part of it. We will continue to, to have a dialogue and, and investigate. And so I think that part of our response as a council has been, yeah, you can say whatever you want as long as you can back it up and are willing to contribute. And maybe that doesn't mean you're gonna actually jump on the committee or form the committee, but give us the nexus of the idea of what we need to do to go forward. But to just throw a stone and complain and then sit there with your arms crossed expecting someone, they should do something about it. It's just not gonna happen. And so um, at the election last year, um, you know, one of the first things I said afterwards was, um, my, I was I was very pleased with how um, the numbers shook down in the election and who got elected on council and obviously I got elected, but our mandate was very solid, that there was quite a divergent set of opinions on the councillors that got elected and those that didn't, and me in terms of what my position was and my opponent, and so. My, my faith in humanity was restored post-election because, you know, 75% of the community felt that the approach I was wanting to bring to council and to our city was what they believed. And I couldn't have selected a more competent group of councillors from the 17 that ran for our council than the six that got elected. It was overwhelming that our community, Dauphin, saw, heard what was going on, and very, very convincingly gave us a mandate to say, okay, here's what you said. Here's how you believe things should be. Show us. Go and do it. And so I'll just preface or just add a teeny bit on that. Part of my philosophy also is with many of the organizations and our community itself is 
volunteerism or individual engagement in organizations and groups has changed. I'll say in the old days, when I was a kid, my dad was in a kinsman club and he went to a kinsman meeting every Tuesday night for his life. And he was the president, he was the vice president, he was a district rep, he was a secretary, he was a treasurer, because that's how volunteerism in the 70s and 80s, you, you belong to an organization and you just stuck with it forever. Things changed. And, and, and so often now it, it frustrates me when I work with organizations because part of my professional career was, was working on um, group development and, and organizational development and how to make an organization better. And, I, and I'm a strong believer in the fact that volunteerism and engagement is still as strong and powerful as ever. The difference is people don't sign up for something for the rest of their lives. They need to be connected to it. They need to be passionate about it. They need to understand what their involvement or engagement can do for the cause. And then the one thing that most organizations forget is they, they want an exit strategy. I don't want to belong to this organization forever. I want to belong to get this project completed, to get this thing built, to get this initiative off the ground. And is that a one-year commitment or a six-month commitment or a five-year commitment? But if, if organizations that can clearly communicate that, show people what they're going to get, what they're in for, what's expected of them, and when they can leave are still flourishing. Organizations, municipalities, governments who haven't understood the changing nature of engagement are still flustered and frustrated and going, you know, and you see, and again, I don't want to throw any council or counselors from other municipalities or anywhere under the bus, but you still see some of these old guys kind of go, oh, well, back in the day, we had 35 people coming to the, you know, annual meeting. Now we don't have enough people to fill the executive. And it's just like, well, the organization hasn't changed anything in 35 years. The world around us is completely different but their operating practices haven't changed at all. So again, that's a bit of part of my philosophy and it seems to be working in our community again for now. One last question on the community, sure. then I'm going to turn to the segment three because I'm cautious of time here because I, I just realized we're at 45 minutes and I haven't got to my last one, but I want to ask this one because I think it's a very important uh, question, particularly for local representatives. Now, you were there to represent the entire community of Dauphin and you were there elected by the people. But you have to, as a councillor, as a council, I should say, have to look at all issues as a citywide issue. How is it going to best move the city forward? But at the end of the day, you also have to remember the individual people because they have issues that are important to them that they believe are the most pressing issues in their community. How do you weigh how do you weigh the balance of what the city wants with what the individual wants, because sometimes the individual needs are more important than the city needs, but so, the majority of the time, the city needs are more important than the individual right. needs. Are they not? Well, I, I would answer that by saying context matters. Okay. And I think that I've been a believer in prioritize, prioritization in the sense that um, all things are important to everyone but there's a degree of importance. And what we have to do when we look at the public good, and again, I'm, I'm, you know, this is where I differentiate between the private good and the public good. Yeah. You know, you know, oftentimes, and I'll, and I'll take my career or my history as, a, as an example. They're going, well, well, you know, the municipality should have a fitness center that's free so everyone can use it. And it's like, well, you know, is that a, a you know, one of those basic needs that everyone needs to have, or is that one of those nice to have kinds of things? So if it's a nice to have, and there's an alternative way to get it, then the individual can get it. So I like to take your question and put it into that public good versus private good, first and foremost box and say, where's the public good here? Why do we pay taxes to have a fire department when I've never had a fire in my life? Well, or, how, you know, I don't have, I don't have a car. Why should I be paying for roads? Well, what if an ambulance has to come to your house for you or the fire truck? So, or the garbage truck, to, you know, like, so what, what I respond is saying that everybody has needs, wants, desires. 
But when you put it into the blender of private good or public good, those things that fall into the public good mix get much more attention than those things that that's a private good. That's something that you don't, it's almost like, you know, we all have certain needs, Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs. <laughs> there are certain things that everyone needs to have, but then, you know, there's very few folks that maybe ever get to self-actualization and, you know, have those opportunities. But what do we need to do for the majority of people to meet the majority of those public needs? And, you know, again, once you get beyond that, that's where those real hard decisions, you know, need to be made. But is it I'm, hard to I'm say no to people? Bit. Sorry? Is it hard to say no to people? Because people yes. probably come to you it on a regular is. basis, say, oh, we need better service at this, or yes. we need a new road on my street because it's dilapidated and there's potholes yes. everywhere. And you can say, uh, we don't have enough money unless you want your taxes up by 10 percent. it's yeah. not happening yeah. no and and that's where it gets back to you know context yeah the notion that here we go this is important to 99 out of 100 people in our community so we're going to put a lot of attention on that issue this is important to three out of 100 people in our community so Thanks for bringing it to our attention. And if, you know, certain things can happen or we'll see if we can find some money for that or we'll apply for some grants. But also it gets back to, I can flip the, you know, the script a little bit and go, so what are you going to do to help us get what you want? So if someone says, well, I need more trails in my part of the community. Okay, what might you be willing to do to help us convince others or you know would you be involved in an active transport committee would you like to provide some of your input uh, those kinds of things so it's complicated there's no right or wrong answer but um uh, again i think that we've created a climate where we allow people to bring those items forward but we also challenge or ask them to have a solution and or then might you also be willing to engage and that doesn't mean necessarily pay for, but contribute to achieving that. And so that makes it sort of, it nuances the argument and it, it gives people opt in, opt out, or, you know, oftentimes if it's just no without any response, then they can go, arr, arr, arr. but if it's like, well, here's a situation that, you know, you provide three or four points of, of context, information, background, and then all of a sudden they might go, hmm, Maybe that isn't as important as this, 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 and this. Because we raised taxes this this year, and we didn't have one formal objection. Because we, and again, there was probably lots in the coffee shop or on the street, but to us formally, we justified the rationale for why we need to do this how this benefits our community, what it means to you in the long run, and how it's not an expense, but it's an investment. And there's a real, real, you know, differential between people thinking you're just spending my money, as opposed to no, you're investing my money, so that I have a better future. So I don't know. It's a little bit philosophical, but it seems like you're, you're you have that mindset. But I, I want to turn to my last subject, and it's kind sure. of an important one for myself because I enjoy yeah. it and I love tourism. I think that Canadians should be spending more tourism dollars in Canada in our local communities because right. I think we have so many hidden gems. I, I just visited Dauphin earlier this summer, as I said off the off the recording with you, uh, and I enjoyed so much. And I feel like I just scratched the surface. What are some of the tourist highlights that you would want a tourist coming through your community to see? Well, obviously, the, the the big ones are we we have two major festivals that, um, you know, have been around a long time, the Ukraine Festival, almost 60 years and Country Fest, 35 years. And those are major draws as events. But we have a significant development at Northgate on, you know, 11 kilometers south of town at the edge of Riding Mountain National Park. We have 26 miles of built trail and just the most um, intriguing elevation change in, in the province. And 
uh, we've had a group that, again, based on what I said a little while ago about organizations and getting people engaged, you know, we have over $2.5 million worth of investment up there, almost none of it municipal funding, um, all through grants and foundational and money and federal and provincial funding. And but just a spectacular um, uh, location event. Um, I'm a fat bike guy. I'm a mountain bike guy. Um, you know, it's it's just an amazing um, it's an amazing location, and um, what we've tried to do is, and again, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, you know, you know, mention this about Eric Irwin. Um, he indicated when this, when the Northgate Group, the Dolphin Derailleur Cycle Club, was developing this trail plan, um, he said, "Yeah, you know, Dolphin could be Canmore of the Prairies," and that's been in our head where we're thinking that. Um, adventure tourism, um, being outside, COVID proved it. That place was humming during COVID. The parking lot would be full of vehicles and you wouldn't bump into anyone because we had such a vast <laughs> network of trails. And so we could adhere to all of the restrictions about you know being in contact with non-family members, but had this facility and were, were able to have people experience it on their own terms. We've been able to work with that organization, and they've done a tremendous job of generating funds and developing that trail network. So we want Dauphin to be Canmore of the Prairies. We want you to come here and experience Northgate, Riding Mountain National Park. The Duck Mountains are just 30 minutes northwest of us. I live, you know, 15 kilometers out of town at Lake Dauphin. It's a beautiful you know, beautiful um, um, summer and, you know, winter time activity. But we're trying to make our community. Um, I'm a huge believer that, you know, tourism is is an integral part of who we are because we don't have location. We don't have natural resource in the sense of mining community or a pulp and paper community or a mill. So, we're 200 kilometers or so from the border. We're 300 kilometers from Winnipeg. We're not on any major routes, but what do we have? We have wonderful natural resources. We have clean air. We have affordable land. We have a great place to visit. So we have natural history. We have museums. We have all kinds of, of neat things. So you can have tremendous experiences. And that's what we're working on. We're working on the experience. A friend of mine told me many years ago that, that people that, Tourists travel lightly, but they almost all of them have a wallet. <laughs> and so what we want to do is provide a, an exceptional experience, whether it's attending one of our festivals or walking in CN Park or downtown and visiting the Watson Art Center for a show or getting out to Northgate for a fat bike ride or just a hike or being in Clear Lake. And, you know, we're working with um, Clear Lake Country and the Riding Mountain National Park to get people to come north, because when we talk to the parks folks, they're going on a Saturday or Sunday in the summer, we're full. Clear Lake is at capacity but more people are coming. So how do we draw some of those folks to go, you know, 40 kilometers north and experience Northgate or get into Dauphin? So I agree with you. I think tourism is industry. It doesn't pollute. It doesn't rob natural resource. And it is recyclable. It, 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 you can come back to an event, but we're working really hard with groups in our community to create experiences because I think and it's the experience that matters. You come to Dauphin and you have a good experience. You're going to tell somebody. And if you have a bad experience, you're going to probably tell more people. And so <laughs> well, what we want to do is ensure that you have a good experience so that hopefully you'll tell two or three people and they'll come and rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And away we go. Well, I, I've only spoken highly of Dauphin since I've left uh, l earlier in August, and I can tell you right now, uh, it was probably one of my favorite stops because, you're, like I said to you beforehand, your staff were amazing. I feel bad for the, the 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 woman that I dealt with at the counter because I think I shook her by asking her on a Friday afternoon, does your city have lapel pins, and is there a way that I can find a museum? And she pulled out a map, and she gave me this the best instructions, and she gave me a phone number of a gentleman who 
I was able to call and get more information about my family who's from Dauphin in the 30s. So uh, I've only spoken highly of Dauphin since I've left and I could only speak highly of it. And I'm so wanting to get back there again because I feel like I said, I only scratched the surface of your community. Well, I'll invite you back and um, in a couple months and um, the derailers, uh, we have, uh, we have, the club owns 12 fat bikes. And so we can, um, you know, allow people to use bikes, groups to get experience the, the trail system. But I'm personally inviting you to come out and we'll go out there winter or not. And um, uh, we'll gear you up and we'll give you a fat bike experience. And then hopefully um, you'll even be more excited and and uh, more willing to, you know, blow the trumpet about Dauphin and come up and well, see us. I'm going to ask you to blow the trumpet of Dauphin for two seconds and give me the Coles note version of this question. In your opinion, and it's the million dollar question at the end of the day, what makes the city of Dauphin such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, I'll, I'll take it back to, again, my history back in the 80s. Um, the whole notion of how we didn't have this, we didn't have that. Oh, poor us. Oh, it was just sort of a, not a negative approach, but it was just, oh, you know, kind of like, you know, Eeyore and, you know, just kind of, oh, oh, you know, just meandering through life. And so um, in the early 90s, when we got the rec complex going and people kind of said, wow, this is Dauphin. We have an indoor pool. We have an indoor pool with a wave machine, like the only one in the province. Like, And, and I had an older gentleman on our opening day of the rec complex, the grand opening, he's standing there and he was one of our harshest critics until it was open. And then he became one of our most, our unofficial tour guide. But he basically said, he looked around and he said, I can't believe this is Dauphin. And so we 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 flipped the switch of being the Eeyore of oh Portage gets this, Winkler gets that, Steinbeck gets this, oh poor Dauphin to no, if we do we can do stuff, we can have stuff here. So then we hosted the Manitoba Summer Games in two thousand and four. Um, at the time, and I to this day I would still say one of the best games ever. We got to use Solo Ukraine and had the amphitheater and had the Cossacks riding across the field with their horses and the cannon going off on the opening ceremonies and had the mountain bike race, the kids riding across the stage because the, the trail was right there. Like we gave them an experience that they hadn't had at any other games. And afterwards, people in the community went, well, that wasn't so bad. Like that was actually good. We had more volunteers. We needed a thousand volunteers. We had to turn 300 people away. We had 1,300 volunteers in a town of 8,500 for the Manitoba Games. Then a few years later, we hosted the Royal Bank Cup, like, you know, the National Junior Hockey Championship. And we sold out, you know, wow. a huge success for the community. And again, so I think we've created this, we have a host mentality. We're like your baba. Come on, we'll feed you. We'll give you a nice comfy bed. We'll, you know, give you some pierogies and give you a nice meal. And we hope you come back, you know, <laughs> like the old Beverly Hillbillies. Come on back now, you hear? Like we, we want you to have a good experience here. And we've become good hosts. And our two major festivals, you know, show that in spades on the kind of event that they put on in good times and in bad financially and fiscally there's always been something about we pull together you you know you mentioned earlier you know with an emergency and disasters how we pull together but we've been able to peel off a little bit of that and pull together for the non-emergency kind of stuff let's work together make something good because if we don't it's not going to happen and you know so i'll use the analogy to end this by saying um if, if it can happen in Dauphin, it can happen anywhere. So anybody can get anything they want if they pull together. And and we've proven it with some of the projects we pulled off and some of the things we've done. And, and that's just our philosophy going forward. It can happen here. So, David, I, I want to much for you <laughs> it, I, I enjoyed this 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 was probably one of the greatest interviews i've done on a tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning so uh thank you so much for sitting down with me today this has been a a wonderful experience and um 
I, I never know what I'm going to get when I go into these interviews. I, right. I've had really like uh, reserved mayors. I've had really uh, outgoing mayors. And it seems like you have a passion for your community and you have a passion for what you do to make your community a better place. So thank you for sitting down with me. And also thank you for serving your community. We need more people like you at council table. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I, I hope I didn't uh, you know, take up too much of your time today. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now, your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of making municipality issues matter again. Now, as we wrap up, I hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate worlds of municipal politics and municipal government from today's interview. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with this show, Cross Border Interviews, but all of our shows, Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. But you're also playing an intricate role, a vital role, if that, in supporting our endeavors to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission of making municipal issues prominent on a national stage, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca and clicking on that support us now page. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can deliver the kind of content like today's interview you've come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, keep talking.